So today we are going to be uh, looking at a new series. It's called This I Believe. And so we're going to start off the series today by hearing from the Gospel of John, the 17th chapter. So I invite you to stand as you're able in honor of the reading of the Gospel passage today. John chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So the human mind is an interesting thing. It's interesting because of what it chooses to remember and what it chooses to not remember. Okay? Sometimes we'll forget where we'll put our car keys in the morning, right? If you don't have a designated space, you'll lose your car keys. You'll lose your cell phone. Sometimes the cell phone's in your hand and you're looking for it. Glasses, same thing. Our mind won't remember those little things. But yet, then there's things way back, way back for some of us, that it does remember. And we don't know why it remembers it. Well, for me, I don't remember much about kindergarten, okay? I do remember I repeated it, okay? So I did kindergarten twice. I really loved it, so I did it twice. But I remember I didn't like nap time. Which, you know, who liked forced a nap time in kindergarten? Now I wish we had forced nap time. Please tell me to go to sleep at 1 p.m. today. I'll do it, okay? I was the one always awake, so I had the special job of getting the yardstick. And I don't know why they gave me a yardstick. It could have ended really badly. But I was to tap gently everybody on the shoulder, not whack them, but tap them and wake them up when it's time to wake up. Because I never would sleep, okay? But I remember, besides that, I remember... One time when I met one of my friends, one of my really good friends that I had growing up. And it's so odd that we became friends in this way. But one day it was raining really good. And so I brought a light blue rain jacket with me. Okay, And all the kids were running in with rain jackets because it was just pouring down rain. And so we were hanging up our jackets on the hooks. And a guy or boy hung his right up next to me that had the same color jacket as I did. I looked at it, I looked at him, and then for some reason, we looked at the tags, and we had the same tag on the jacket. It was the same jacket. It was a London Fog rain jacket, and what stood out to me was the picture of the tower of Big Ben, the clock tower. I'm like, we've got the same jackets, and he's like, yeah, we got the same jackets, and I was like, cool, we're friends, and that's how that happened. We were friends. We had the same London Fog rain jacket, and so there it started. We'd play together on the playground at recess hung out together, and we had a really good time growing up. You know, even in elementary school when he would get put in different classes, we still would catch up on the playground. And then eventually our parents became friends, so we got invited to each other's birthday parties, and so we just had a really good friendship. I've been blessed when I was younger with some really good friendships. Well, one day when we were in middle school, or one time, he had decided to invite me to go with his church. He went to a different church than I did to his church, to a North Carolina trip to Rockmont. It was a retreat place. And so I said, sure. You know, he was the only one that I knew, but I would go with him, with this church, I think it was sixth or seventh grade year, to Rockmont. But something, something was off. You know, when you think back to your friends, you know, you could probably remember the moment that you met your friends, okay? And y'all grew together and got to know each other you would soon pick up when your friend was kind of off, having a bad day, having a bad moment. You kind of pick up on that with your really good friends. And they can pick up on you, too, when you're having a bad day, bad moment. I knew something was off with my friend. And throughout the trip, he just seemed to be very aggravated, agitated. I was, like, getting it on his nerves all the time. It's almost like he didn't want to be my friend anymore. Like, he didn't even like me. And I can't remember what it was, but we fought over something on this trip. And we decided to not to speak each other for, to each other on the rest of the trip. So here I was with a different church, not knowing a lot of folks, having to make new connections, because my really good friend and I, we were not happy with each other. And then on the ride back, we didn't sit by each other on the bus. 
And then for the rest of that summer, where we normally would have met up and gone to swimming together or done things together or spent the night together, he never reached out. Well, then school started back. And in middle school, you changed classes. So I had some classes with him. But still, early in the year, he would never really acknowledge me or talk, and I couldn't quite figure out what it was. It became very troubling. You know, when you and your friends tend to fight and aren't talking to each other, it gets a little troubling, a little sad. Well, here in this moment that we have with Jesus, in this moment, it is a sad moment, a troubling moment for the disciples. The Gospel of John is a beautiful gospel. Different than Matthew, Luke, Mark. The synoptics is different when you read it. In John's gospel, when you look at the 14th chapter into the 17th chapter, you have this moment where Jesus is with his disciples. A lot of Bible studies will call those chapters the farewell discourse. It is Jesus' final moments, uninterrupted moments with his closest believers and followers, the 12 disciples. He would have washed their feet and they would have had their last meal or be getting ready for their last meal in these chapters of 14 through 17. And he's just talking to them personally, sharing with them, warning them about what's going to happen to him. And they became troubled. They knew something was up. Something was different with Jesus. And so here you have this scene of the disciples. Jesus has done everything that he needed to do at this point with his earthly ministry. He's no longer going to preach to the multitudes. He's done. No more miracles and healings that you can see. He has done everything he needed to do. And so now he's having this moment with his disciples. The only thing that's left for him is to go to the cross and die. That's the only thing he has left to do but to die for us. And so when you get to the 17th chapter, when you get to these verses, you begin to see that Jesus says, after he had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, You know, when we pray today, many of us were taught that you bow your head, put your hands together, right? Kneel down, look down, close your eyes. Don't you dare open your eyes when you pray, right? I remember when we would do the blessing at the dinner table and I'd open my eyes at home and look around. My mom would kind of kick me to close my eyes while we're saying the blessing. Close your eyes. See, that's how we pray. In Jesus' day, it was very common to pray with your eyes open looking up to the heavens. That's how they prayed. That's how they prayed in Jesus' day. So here when you see... After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said. He just looked up and prayed. You see, the disciples are around. They're hearing this prayer. They're hearing this prayer. Because after this prayer that Jesus gives, then he goes to the garden. So they're witnessing this prayer, listening to this prayer. There are a lot of beautiful prayers in the Bible by a lot of important biblical people. But this is the most important one. This is the one... That Jesus prays. And he's praying for his disciples. He's praying for you and me. And so we get to hear what he is exactly saying to God. And so he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. So that your son may glorify you. Father. He could have addressed God in any way. He said, Father. And that shows you the intimate relationship of Jesus and God. The family type relationship they have. Father. It's an intimate word. Intimate word. The hour has come. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. When you hear the word glory and glorify in today's time, you kind of think about individuals doing great things to glorify themselves, right? Or athletes trying to win the game and all their glory and all the celebration is all for them, right? Or when people are running for political office and they win, it's all about them, all for the glory, right? This is a different type of glory, though. This is a different type of glory. It's not that individual type of glory. 
This is the type of glory that Jesus is asking God, saying, Hey, God, as your son, glorify me. Not to say that I'm almighty and everything, but he is. But that wasn't the intent. It was so that you may be glorified. So people get to see you and know you and experience your love and grace and see that through me. Use me as your vessel. Use me. It was a selfless act of giving of himself for the glory of God. You know, Jesus was fully human, fully divine. He was both. The human side of Jesus would have rather not gone to the cross to glorify God because it was a painful death, a humiliating death. But yet, the divine side of him knew that it was necessary and part of that was to glorify God and to save us from ourselves. And so he released himself and surrendered himself to the will of God. You know, it's okay to pray And say, hey, God, please heal me from this. He wants to hear your prayers. He knows what's on your heart. He just needs to hear you say it. But another part of prayer is also to align yourself to the will of God. And what he is calling you to do is for you to seek him and to hear him and what he is asking you to do. That is the intent of prayer. That is what we're to do. And that is what Jesus is doing here. Where he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. And then he continues. He says, since you have given him authority, all people give eternal life to all who have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Verse 3 is where all this really hinges upon. Verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you. Know, the word know. You know, to know something is to have knowledge, to have the head knowledge, right? To know facts, to know statistics, to know how to cook a meal, how to drive a car. Knowledge, know. But this isn't talking about that. Yes, we have the head knowledge of God. We can read scripture and memorize verses, chapters, books, all that, and that's great, and that is good. But this is a different no, that they may know you. No means to be in relationship. It's to have a relationship. So when Scripture says they know somebody, when someone says they know someone, that means they're in a relationship with that individual. They know them. They know them. Just like how I knew my friend in middle school, something was off. And something caused him to not want to talk to me enough to have that fight. I knew something, but I could not pinpoint it. He would not tell me. It took him almost a whole school year before one day we were finally talking. And I found out that his mom was battling, or had just battled, breast cancer. She survived. And once he knew she was safe... And he wrestled with that personally. He was ready to talk. I knew him. I knew something was off. I just didn't know what. But after he told me that and shared that with me, I knew him even more. Because we had a relationship. And then from that moment, after he told me, we picked right back up where we left off before we went on that retreat. And we became good friends again. All through high school. Even when he changed schools before I did, we still kept up. He was one of my many groomsmen in my wedding. We kept up. And as fate would have it, after we went to college, we kind of lost touch in college. Sometimes when you go to different colleges and you get married, you get busy with life, then you reconnect. As fate would have it, he lives in my neighborhood now. But I, I knew him and he knew me. We had a relationship. And each year it got deeper and deeper in us understanding and appreciating each other. Here, when Jesus says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent, to have eternal life, it's not something you gain at the end of your life. No, it is now, and you achieve it now by knowing God, by having a relationship with God. 
by having a relationship with Jesus. That's when you achieve eternal life, is by knowing him, being in relationship with God. And you hear preachers, you hear me say this, you hear Sunday school teachers say this all the time. But it's so true. The way you get to grow in your relationship with God, first, read your Bible. And really read it. Get help reading it. Attend a Bible study. A Sunday school class. A small group. A group of other believers. So you can wrestle and ask questions and study the Bible together. Pray. Like I said, through prayer, you do ask God for things, for healings and for guidance and for protections and for all of this. And you confess what's on your heart. But then in that moment, you are aligning yourself what he is calling you to do in that moment. So prayer. And by giving of yourself, of your material blessings, of your time, your talents, your witness, your testimony. You hear that all the time, but it's so true. That's how you grow in your relationship. Attend worship. Worship God in all that you do. Because when you do those things, you're getting to know him more and more and more. Because he is and wants to be in a relationship with you. The good news about our God that created everything that you see and everything that you don't see is that we were created to be in a relationship with him. He didn't put things in motion and just step back and say, well, let it be whatever happens, happens to my creation for good or for bad. He is constantly working through our lives. He is constantly providing paths for us to reconnect to him. He gave his son for us so that we can have salvation and life in him. We are called to know God, to grow in relationship to him. So the series, as I said, is going to be called This I Believe. And this is a perfect verse, perfect passage to start off with. Because before you can state what you believe, which one of my favorite activities that I did when I taught confirmation, and that is when our middle schoolers, typically seventh graders, will go through an intensive class to learn Uh, A lot about the Bible, a lot about the Methodist Church, a lot about faith, and a lot about themselves. But one of my favorite things to do for them in those classes is say, hey, write down what you believe. Write it down. What do you believe? What do you believe about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit? What do you believe about Christ? And just see what they say. And some of the most beautiful statements of faith are written that way. You can get a Methodist hymnal and look in the back and find all these creeds and find all these statements of faith, and they're great. I encourage you, if you don't look at those, to look at those as it lays out the foundations of our faith. But before you can even get to that point, before even you know what you believe, you need to know God. You need to know God first. You need to have that relationship and build on that relationship with Him. And then your beliefs will become more fleshed out. So before you even get to this I believe, you've got to know the one that wants to be in relationship with you. And so as we go through this series, as we go through this this week, as we go through looking at the different parts of our faith over the next few Sundays and what we believe as, as Christians, what are the foundational things that we believe, work on your relationship with God wherever you are. Some of y'all are probably daily reading, daily praying, daily everything with God. And that's great. Keep it up. And some of us, maybe it's, you know, not so much so. So what's preventing you from starting today? What is preventing you from starting today? So I encourage everybody to continue and to grow in their relationship with God through scripture reading, through prayer, through worship, through witness, Giving, all of that. I encourage you to do that. Take that step because it will transform your world. It will change your life. And when your life is being changed for the good, people will see it. People will notice it. And you will be that person that may motivate them to do the same. 
It'll catch on like wildfire. And so I challenge each and every one of you to grow in your relationship to God, to know God just as well as you know your very best friend in life. Because he wants to be that person too in your life. He wants to be your number one. So why don't you let him do that? Let's pray.